So, <clears throat> I have a bit of a cold today, so I'm going to get through it. But if my voice fails, I will take a drink of water. If my <laughs> mic fails, I will use Asha's. When she came over and sat down next to me, she said, change the batteries, I forgot to. And what I did tell her is, I have no idea how to change the batteries. <laughs> Uh, if I change mics, that's why. So today, we are here to talk about doubt. We are here to celebrate doubt. I'm going to start with a story. When my brother was five years old, he went out, my sister's laughing, he went out to the family car, and he pushed in the cigarette lighter, and he waited for it to pop out. Now, that was back in the day before cigarette lighters were actually the 12-volt power connectors they are now. Back then, they actually lit our cigarettes. Yeah. And do you all remember that little red circle? <laughs> okay. So, my parents had told him that if you push in the cigarette lighter and you wait for it to pop out, that little red circle is really hot. But he had no experience of this, and he didn't believe them. Yeah. So, he pushed it in, it popped out, he took it out, and he stuck his finger in the hole. And guess what? He had a direct experience. <laughs> As we say now, it was a teaching moment. He had a very inquiring mind. So what happened for him is before he had had some information, he had no experience, and he had a little doubt. So he went and questioned, and he found out. So today what I would like to do is I would like to discuss doubt, but of a different kind. Religious doubt or spiritual doubt. Now, if you've ever had any doubt about your spiritual beliefs or your religious beliefs, I want to tell you that you are in excellent company. Yeah. Doubt has a blue blood lineage. Early doubters include St. Augustine, St. John of the Cross, John the Baptist, uh, Meister Eckhart, uh, Teresa of Avila, even Jesus himself throughout the New Testament had moments of doubt, the latest being on the cross itself. So as I researched this talk, I came across a New York Times article from 2014 discussing the Archbishop of Canterbury, the head of the Anglican Church of England. Okay, so he had a rush of candor in a newspaper interview, and he mentioned to a reporter that he sometimes wondered if God was even there. Mm. Oh my goodness. The International Business Times called it the doubt of the century. The newspapers shouted that atheism was on the rise and this was proof I'm not making this up. And this was proof positive. What this Archbishop of Canada, if the Archbishop of Canterbury thinks that, my God. So actually his remarks were kind of tame, but all they did was prove that he was human. At some point we all have doubts about our connection with the divine, about our place in the universe, about perhaps the existence of the divine. Doubt goes back thousands of years. It's been with us forever. We are human, and it is supremely human to doubt at times and to wonder. So if you ever have had any questions or doubts, you are in excellent company. So the reason I want to talk about doubt today is this. Here at One World and in other New Thought communities, we talk a lot about belief. We talked about it last week. We talk about the profound conviction, the profound nature of our belief to drive our reality, to create our futures, to bring our good to us, don't we? We talk about that a great deal. That is pretty strong stuff. And sometimes I wonder if when you're hearing that, you are wondering, well, if I don't believe it 100%, am I missing something? Is somebody getting something maybe that I'm not because I just wonder? Sometimes we can be sitting there, and you may be sitting there, and you may be thinking, I want to believe. I know in my mind I can co-create my good. I really want to believe. But there's a little voice in your head that might be saying, yeah, right. <laughs> kind of like the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other. The devil's like, yeah, right. It may not be the first time you've heard that voice. Over the years, many of you may have doubted your most fundamental beliefs. You doubted them and you discarded some. You awaken to others and you begin your path again. It's a progression. You begin the search again and again. If we know one thing, 
It's that creation is ever created. Don't we know that? We are made of infinite stuff. We are made of the creative mind. And so we are ever creating. We are not static. Just as creation, as spirit is not static, neither are we. So many of us growing up did not learn what we here at One World teach. The notion that you can create your own good, that you can create your future, just flies in the face of much that we have been taught. As children, we likely were not taught that we were powerful, much less that we were expressions of the divine. That, in many circles, is downright heretical. I told you a while back about a story that happened to me, an incident that happened to me when I was about uh, 10 years old in my church growing up. I was in the junior choir, and we sang once a year in our Christmas concert. And so we were all lined up in our little black robes and those white things you put over it, and we were going to go on and sing the Christmas carols. And I was standing next to a blackboard. And so, being me, I grabbed a piece of chalk and I wrote on it in big letters, I am God, in capitals, all caps. And then I stood back and I kind of looked at it because I liked it. Okay, at this point, the assistant minister comes in, and oh my goodness, the man nearly passed out. I might as well have written, I am Satan, for the effect that it had on this guy. He went pale, he, he, he was appalled, because me writing that went against everything that he believed, and everything he believed that we had been taught. So he looked at me and he said in, in, in just a shocked voice, he said, no, you're not. Heavens. So the lessons that I got, and the lessons that many of you may have gotten as you were coming up in your original faith traditions may have been that you are not powerful, that you are not divine. The lessons may have been that you are a sinner who needs to be saved and that you live according to the rules of a God that judges. We're not there anymore. But those lessons that you learned then, they may have been the beginning of a faith journey that now sees you here. That journey for many of you has involved questioning fundamental truths that you once were told were eternal, fixed, and absolutely unalterable. Now, doubt may start small, most of us, as we know, don't go to bed believing in a um, you know, paternal father God figure and waking up the next morning having come to an entirely new understanding or rejecting the notion of God altogether. That's not how it works. Doubt is a journey, just as spiritual awakening is. As a matter of fact, it's the same journey. Mm -hmm. Doubt can start with examining individual questions of belief, why does God tell me that a newborn baby is a sinner? Why am I going to go to hell if I've been divorced? Why, if there's a God, is there so much evil in the world? Why is it so hard for the good to prosper? Why is it so easy for the wicked to prosper? And why not, at least, is the playing field not level? These are tough questions. <clears throat> They go on and on. Whatever your individual questions are, they may start small. It's kind of like a, a pebble that hits your windshield. You know, it starts with something really small, and then it just grows. And it takes up the whole thing after a while. You start with small questions. Maybe some of those issues I raised, just one or two. And then over time, it grows. And you start to doubt your relationship to God. You start to wonder about your place in the universe. At some point, you may even come to doubt the existence of a benevolent, powerful force itself. That is the way doubt may start intellectually in your mind. You may just think yourself into just wondering what it's all about. But questioning can also start in a different way, in a more subtle way that sometimes is not even noticed. As you go through your spiritual practices, have you ever noticed that sometimes they just seem a little dry? Mm -hmm. Have you ever felt that sometimes your spiritual life is kind of on hold? Mm -hmm. I know I'm not the only one who's oh, felt yeah. that. That is just something that happens to all of us. Now you go through the motions. You come to church because you're used to it and you like the people here. You may even continue your spiritual practices, but you just feel 
less. Less is coming to you. Your spiritual life is not as nourishing as it once was. It doesn't energize. It doesn't sustain you as it once did. Now you may think, okay, well this is all there is. You know, this is good enough. I'm better than I was. I feel okay. I like my friends. And yet, at the same time, you are still going through a time of spiritual isolation or even loneliness. This experience is common, I believe. So as I was preparing this talk, I gave a lot of thought to how we start disbelieving what we previously thought was true and about how we back away from our own spiritual practices and how we wonder if it's true that we are indeed missing something. And the first thing I thought was that for a New Thought community, this is an odd question because there's not a great deal of emphasis in New Thought communities placed on doubt. As a matter of fact, I got, I mean, you know me and Google. Okay, so I got on a website of a large national organization that teaches New Thought principles. And I did a word search for doubt. Do you know how many hits I got? None. 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 Instead, in New Thought, what, I, what I'm finding is that often doubt is something to be overcome. You, you, it's not healthy to doubt, so you just have to get over it. You have positive affirmations, you have continued mind treatments, you, um, you just keep, you keep engaging in positive thinking. And all that is true. I mean, we explored the extraordinary power of belief last week. I'm not saying that's not true. But what I am suggesting is that perhaps it's not true for everybody. Our, our spiritual journeys are so individual. There are those of us who prefer to attack our doubts head on because we think that it's a potential for growth. Um, there are those who over time have become grateful for their periods of doubt and even downright disbelief because they felt that it propelled them further in their journey. Far from being an experience to be avoided, traveling through the questions and even traveling through darkness can be for many a time of growth and understanding and awakening. In her book on the history of religious doubt, called Doubt, <laughs> Jennifer Michael Hecht writes, when men and women take on a quest for inner transformation, they become engaged in grappling with doubt. So let's think about that phrase, inner transformation. Isn't that really what we're looking for? In our spiritual practices, we are seeking an inner transformation that leads us to awakening. Now, we can appreciate intellectual belief, we can appreciate an intellectual understanding of what we believe to be true, but it's not until we live it, it's not until it moves from here to here that it becomes awakening. If we only think it, we are only getting half a loaf. True transformation, true awakening occurs when our beliefs become so internalized that we are living them as what we know is true for us. Some call it faith, some call it conviction, some call it trust. It really doesn't matter what you call it. It happens when you awaken to your own truth. This is the questioning that doubt leads us through, that questioning leads us through. When we take in what we are told, or what we hear, or what we read, but we sit with it, we think about it, we mold it, and at some point, all of it, or a kernel of it, or what we think because of it, is so internalized that it becomes our truth. And that's when we say, yes, that is true for me. Haven't you ever had that experience? It only happens when it becomes part of you. We cannot ask anyone else to take our spiritual journey for us. It is our walk. We are each expressions of spirit, and we each have our own conversations with spirit. That is what we do ourselves. We cannot find our truth by simply ingesting someone else's. Sister Joan Chittister writes, once we have pursued our doubts to the dust, we forge a stronger, not a weaker, belief system. 
These truths are true, we know, because they are now true for us, rather than for simply someone else. She writes that doubt is the beginning of real faith. She calls doubt the mother of conviction. It is our growth, our own experience with the questions that drives us to our own awakening. Often it is our experience in the world itself, not just thinking it through, that leads to our continued growth. I have a good friend who grew up in a conservative Christian church. And this could be a conservative church of any, any faith tradition, but hers happened to be Christian. As a child, she believed what she was told, and it made her feel safe because she was small, the world was large, and it made her feel safer to have something more powerful than she was at her back. But as she grew older, the lessons just started not to make sense. She started to doubt what she was hearing from her ministers and from her teachers. Out of that little crack of doubt grew a widening web of doubt until she started to disbelieve what she had been told about herself, about <coughs> God, about her relationship with the universe. The way she put it was, I lost my faith. What she did, though, is she continued to live her life. She served her friends. She loved her family. She worked in her community. She treated others with kindness and love and compassion. She then had the opportunity to go on an overseas medical mission to help care for patients in a third world country who were suffering from conditions that over here are taken care of with really simple procedures. And she was gone for several months. The experience just changed her. When she came back, as she put it to me, she said, everywhere I looked, I saw tiny miracles that she hadn't seen before. And then she looked back over her life, and she saw that the miracles had always been there. She just had not seen them before. That trip and that experience opened her eyes to a new awareness, a new awakening, a new way of seeing her world. Now, she may not believe what she was taught as a child, but she knows that even though she doesn't call it God, she knows that there is a power at work, whatever it is. And it has changed her experience of the world. This is her truth internalized and born over years of living in the question, sometimes consciously, sometimes not, but always being open to the possibility that there are answers. Always being open to the possibility of growth. Ram Dass teaches that Western society has the head leading the heart so intensely that sometimes our head will embrace something before our heart gets there. Have you ever had that experience? I so have had that experience. I really think this is true, but then in my heart there's a little voice going, well, maybe not. This gap gives rise to uncertainty and to doubt. Our intellect cannot supply the conviction that is needed for the heavy lifting of inner transformation. Our head cannot do that. Instead, it is our experience of our world, touched and inspired by spirit, that fixes in us the knowing that we have found our truth. That is how we come to know on our own individual walks what is good for us. As Joseph Campbell wrote, I don't need faith, I have experience. It doesn't mean we don't need faith. It doesn't mean we don't search after something called faith. But it also means at some point, faith translates into experience. Now, so often, those who refuse to doubt, who refuse to question, they are the ones who seem the most certain. It's almost as though they fear to doubt, as though doubt means I have no faith, as though doubt is a sign of spiritual weakness. But it's not. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Certainty is. Let me say that again. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Certainty is the opposite of faith. I think Anne Lamott said that in one of her books. I really endorse her as an author. But sometimes we think that doubt and faith are opposites, but they're not. Where there is certainty, think about it. There is no need to question. If you're certain of something, there's no need to question it. It is doubt 
that leads us into the questions that drives our awakening. It is not something to be feared. It is not a bad thing. Last week, we talked about belief, about profound conviction. That belief, that conviction often arises in us after we have been through a period of questioning. Perhaps after we have been through a period of darkness, even of loneliness. Our journey into the light is not an unremitting succession of one joyous awakening after another. It's just not. Sometimes there are periods of loneliness, there are periods of questioning, there are periods of dryness, there are periods where sometimes we just don't know what the next step is. But as Tom read in his reading, that doesn't mean the light is not there. It just means this is part of our faith journey, and we just need to keep going. Doubt or unbelief is not something to be feared. It is the process of creating your own truth. So here at One World, let's not shy away from the questions. If we have a question, let's say it. Let's explore it together. Let's celebrate them as pathways to growth, to community, to further awakening, individually and as a community. We have to remain open. We all have different answers, but that doesn't mean that we don't all have a voice in exploring the questions. It's the only way that we will be able to continue our faith journey to awakening. So let's take these thoughts into meditation.